If you have ascites, let's discuss how you can get it under control to feel more comfortable and energetic. The first step to get ascites under control is to drain it. And we do this through a procedure called a paracentesis. Not only does it provide immediate relief, it allows us to get a diagnosis of what's causing your ascites and if there's any complications. To perform a paracentesis, we inject local anesthetic and then make a small incision through which we insert a needle into the abdomen. That allows us to place a catheter that will drain the fluid out. That fluid is then sent to the lab to make an analysis of whether there's an infection. For our purposes, we're gonna discuss how to manage when there is not an infection. If you're not acutely ill, then we can usually drain all the fluid at the initial paracentesis, which provides you the most amount of relief from your ascites. But if we remove more than just a few liters, we need to give you IV protein back to maintain your fluid balance, and that helps protect your kidneys. Now that the fluid is off, your goal is to keep it off. And the first way to do that is by looking at the sodium in your diet. Now, many patients will tell me, I don't use a salt shaker, and that is a great start. However, to use one would be like trying to salt the ocean. The American diet is overloaded with sodium, often containing four grams a day, when we should really only be having two. Why do doctors always harp on your sodium intake? To understand why, let's discuss the kidney. Your kidney is capable of filtering a very large amount of water every day, enough to fill a large bathtub. And that's incredible. And you would think because of that, it should be able to very quickly get rid of any excess sodium. And yet it does the opposite. It actually hoards sodium. And the reason why is because this was an adaptive response of our ancestors, helped us to survive drought, which allowed us to go on log hunts and become explorers. Today, sodium is abundant, but your kidneys have not adapted to that new reality. Additionally, your kidneys are not aware that you have all this fluid in your belly. In fact, from their perspective, it looks like you're dry because you're not having enough blood reach the kidneys. So they try to do what they know to do in that condition. Hold on to more sodium. A patient with cirrhosis who's prone to ascites can accumulate a large amount of fluid after a salty indulgence. For example, let's say that I went out for pizza on Saturday night. I'm going to be at a high sodium level, and that will remain even if I don't have any more high salt foods until around Monday. That's me being young and healthy. Let's say that I went out for pizza with my dad, who's older. His sodium level would remain high until the midweek and Wednesday. But a patient with cirrhosis who had pizza on Saturday, they're gonna remain at a high sodium level throughout the entire week, which means that even an occasional indulgence in salt will maintain them at a high sodium level perpetually and make them maintain their ascites. So that's why we tell patients with cirrhosis to have a very strict low sodium diet. Now that's what we take in. What can we do to make the kidneys let go of extra sodium? This is where medications come in. And there are two potent medications that can help your kidneys to release salt that they otherwise wanna hold on to. The first one is furosemide, also known as Lasix, and a typical starting dose is 20 milligrams. The second one is spironolactone, also known as aldactone, and a typical starting dose is 50 milligrams. That may be adjusted based on your kidney health and your electrolytes with specific interest in your potassium level. We use these two medications in concert within that specific ratio of 20 to 50 because we've found that that typically maintains a very good potassium balance. Lasix tend to make people waste potassium, whereas spironolactone helps them to hold on to it. The net result when used in these proportions is to maintain a good steady potassium level. And that's very important because if your potassium goes too low or too high, it can cause severe complications. It can start with cramps, but it can actually lead to rhythm problems of your heart. That's why it's important to monitor your electrolytes and your kidney function when you're starting these medications or making significant adjustments and keeping an eye on them from time to time while you're on long-term therapy. There are other medications that have similar effects and those can be substituted when needed. But furosemide, Lasix, and spironolactone, aldactone are the main workhorses of helping to manage your ascites. Two important caveats. First, you must reduce how much sodium you're taking in your diet because the medications alone are not enough to push sodium out to achieve a net loss of sodium to reduce your ascites. Secondly, as you reduce the sodium in your diet, be careful of using salt substitutes. These are often potassium chloride, and when you're on medications like spironolactone, these can increase your potassium levels, potentially to dangerous levels. Here are a couple more points that I wanna clarify because of questions that I'm typically asked by patients. The first is, what's my sodium level? Basic blood work will measure your electrolytes and these include sodium. Patients take a normal sodium level to mean that they're doing a good job at controlling the sodium in their diet, but that's not the case. This is not looking at the total amount of sodium in your body, it's looking at the concentration of sodium in your blood. 
So you can have a lot of sodium and a lot of water and the concentration will balance out and look normal. We judge how much sodium is in your body based on your fluid status, factors about how large your ascites is or how swollen are your legs. Patients are also often advised to reduce how much water they're taking in. Now this is sometimes the right thing to do, but very often it's not necessary. So how can you know when you actually need to do this? This is based on your sodium level. If it's very low, then it means that you may have a lot of sodium in your body, but you've got a ton of extra water. And as a result, that concentration is driven lower. And so when the sodium level is really low, then there is a problem of excess water and you need to restrict water. But more often, the sodium level is only a little bit low or normal. And in that case, you really don't gain much by trying to restrict water. The primary problem is the sodium. What if diet and medications don't treat your ascites? And then you have refractory ascites. And while you could have regular paracentesis to get relief, this is not an ideal situation because there's an infection risk with each procedure. The ideal situation is to get a liver transplant, but there's a lot of hurdles to clear before you can have that. A more immediate solution can be the placement of a specialized shunt called a TIPS. It relieves the congestion of blood that's flowing out of the abdominal organs through the liver on its way home to the heart. This can relieve the problems of portal hypertension. Chief among those are ascites and varices. However, blood that bypasses the liver doesn't have the opportunity to be cleaned of toxins, which can lead to worsening jaundice and confusion. And therefore, this TIPS procedure is reserved for patients who have failed conservative measures. We'll discuss it in a future video. Until then, please subscribe and be safe.